good morning. And first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. In this presentation, we're going to be covering GPFS. The first 20 slides or so will be an introduction to GPFS and some of the parameters. And then I'm going to take you through the setup that we just did in our lab. And during that time, I'll also uh, bring in some from our uh, BPIC and show you some of the commands and the outputs and so on, and talk a little about why we did what we did. We'll talk a little about terminology in an introduction. And then specifically, what we actually set up was a three-node redundant cluster. And one of the reasons we chose a three-node redundant cluster was that we wanted to have disk coming in from two different disk subsystems and do the equivalent of uh, LVM mirroring, which is not supported in GPFS, so you have to do it in a different way. And the reason we wanted that was so that literally if we lost a disk subsystem, we still had full redundancies. So when I talk about building the cluster, we will talk more about that. So let's start with just a, a real quick primer on GPFS. GPFS has actually been around since 1991 on AIX. The current version is 3.5, and a lot of the newer functionality really didn't come in until version 2.3. It's been available on Linux since 2001, and I, I don't have the date when it was uh, came available on Windows, but it's been quite a while. So it's a product that's been around for a very long time, and you know at this point is well proven and very robust. It runs on Power, Intel, Opteron, Linux, across the board, and you know I have a comment that there's thousands of stores, including a lot of the top 500 supercomputers. It's actually implemented in production on a significant number of commercial systems as well. And in fact, we quite often see it used in an Oracle Rack environment, as well as many, many other, not just grids, but areas where people want to be able to share the access to files across multiple systems, and sometimes multiple systems on disparate platforms. So some of the examples where it can be used are file and web servers, databases, digital media, a lot of the analytics and financial data management, those kind of things are now being built on this. Someone already asked me, can we build a cluster across multiple operating systems? Absolutely. Um, you can have a cluster of AIX, Linux, and Windows. So it's actually uh, a very robust environment. So I'm going to start out with a quick definition of what we mean by parallel I.O. Because GPFS stands for the General Parallel File System. So, in terms of parallel I.O., what we're talking about is the ability for a whole bunch of systems to access a shared set of storage as if it's a single file system namespace. They can be accessing it at the same time, and in order to get performance, we do a lot of caching and striping across the disks, which means that you have to take care of locking, and they do that with what's known as a distributed locking mechanism. The idea being that you have a system that's very robust. If you lose a node, you don't lose the system. Now, in the three-node system that we put together, we actually also built in redundancy for the disk subsystem, so that if you lost one disk subsystem, you can still be function. And it can scale to thousands of nodes with a bunch of different I.O. options. For the most part, the nodes can either be direct fiber connected, or you can have fiber connected nodes and some nodes that are actually network connected. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the architecture. Now, the next couple of slides are really there for your edification. Um, it's really the terminology that you'll see used in GPFS. So the cluster is the environment with all of the disks and the nodes. And it's really the entity that we see that we are managing. A storage pool is all of the storage. You know, Some of this is pretty obvious. A node would be an AIX LPAR, a Windows partition, a Linux partition, um, which in some cases could be a server, but I'm assuming everything's virtualized. All right, then you have sets of nodes. You have a configuration manager, which is the one that has overall management responsibility, and a file system manager. In the, in the configuration that I set up, we, went, we were very, very simplistic, and we basically have um, that, being, that being shared amongst the, the three primary nodes. So additional terminology, you'll see the term stripe group. That's really talking about the collection of disks. So I can mount a file system on one disk. I can mount it across multiple disks. 
And when I do that, I end up in a Stripe group. And then we have token managers for all of the locking and consistency. Our meta nodes, which is really when you do a directory block update, that's, a, that's metadata. And you'll actually see that when you define disks, you can define them just to be used for data. You can be define, them to, define them to be used for metadata. Or you can say, just put data and metadata together. In our simplistic design, we did both together. Depending on what's happening with your data, you may not want to separate them. But you'll see when I show you the files you create, that it's actually fairly easy to separate them. And then an NSD is a network shared disk. This is basically, if you think about it, you take the LUNs, the actual H disks, and you actually lay an NSD over the top of it. And then file systems get allocated into NSDs. So the NSD itself is really the GPFS definition of a disk. So what do you get with GPFS? In terms of the functions of GPFS, we're talking about something that's designed to scale. It's referred to as a non-blocking uh, cached parallel I.O. file system. And that's really what it's all about. It's about being able to have multiple systems access data from the same disks at the same time and still get performance where you're not getting blocked on inodes and so on. So it is its own file system type. You cannot create a JFS2 file system within a GPFS environment, but this thing can scale. You can go up to petabytes of storage, and I have a slide coming up in a minute on some of the scaling capabilities. And it also has built into it a lot of things that you can take advantage of, which we didn't do in our simple environment. You can build in disaster recovery. You can build in cluster-to-cluster -cluster configurations so that you have clusters that fail over for each other. You can add quorum management so that individual users can't go above a certain amount of space. You can actually optimized based on how things are accessed. And you can also build in um, integrated life management where you have pools within GPFS and where file sets and so on follow policies and actually get moved around the, day, the disk depending on what you have for your policies. So there's a lot of things you can do with GPFS. Um, in the terms of what we did, we, we kept it fairly simple, but at least you know this is something that we can show you. Um, and obviously you can replicate data, you can take snapshots shots, and you can build clones. A lot of things that you can do and it's, it's built to be very fault tolerant. So in terms of the scaling capability, this is what IBM has actually tested. So you'll see that they've actually tested up to 93 Linux on x86 nodes in a cluster, up to 1530 AIX. Um, for the Linux and AIX combo, the tested number, and this is right out of their FAQ, was 3,794 Linux and 112 AIX all in the same cluster. If you want to go that big, um, there's an email address, which is actually GPFS development, that you should email or have your business partner or IBM email on your behalf and have them proof your configuration. Um, any configuration that exceeds these numbers, development wants to look at to make sure that there's no issues with it and that they are going to be able to support it and give you the kind of support that you need. It's a real smart move to, um, when you're designing something that large, to have them proof the configuration. And I've worked with a couple of guys there, and they're very, very good at what they do. In terms of the file system sizes, as long as you're at higher than GPFS 2.3, and at this point in time you should be on 3.5, um, you can have a file system up to about 2 petabytes. And you know, some of the other tested limitations, you can have 256 file systems. Um, I think it's 2 billion files in the file system. The architectural limit is 2 to the power of 64, um, which is 9 billion, but they, um, that they've actually tested. But you probably don't want to come close to the architectural limit. And like I said, I would, when you're starting to get that big, I would definitely talk to these guys in development and make sure what you're doing is right. There's a whole lot of other scaling limits, and rather than bore you to tears with them, um, I put the link in here for the GPFS cluster FAQ. If you're going to put GPFS in production, you should be very familiar with what's in that FAQ. In terms of what's been seen out there in customers, um, more than 2,000 nodes, um, more than um, 2,000 LUNs, and this is you know in a GPFS environment, um, they've, they've actually seen file systems as large as 2 petabytes. And so on. So you can see that actually people are out there really pushing the limit of this. 
and people have been using tiered storage with solid state and SATA fast drives and tape um, to take advantage of that lifecycle management. And you know, and you're seeing disk I/O rates at these kind of rates just just in normal production. So it's very clear that it's possible to drive GPFS pretty hard. So I already talked about the fact that it's about having a global names, namespace that performs very well. And you know, one of the issues you run into is you have people running against the data in AIX, so you now have a copy down in Windows and SIF so that people can access that and um, you know, work on the same data. So what GPFS is designed to do is have one copy of that data in one place that people work on. Now, if you have like test and development as well as production, you can certainly still have a test and development copy and so on. You just put it in a different file system. Um, but it actually does simplify management and, and gets rid of those copies. So you have a bunch of disks here. Um, you can be connected SAN, TCP IP, or InfiniBand. I've only ever done SAN and TCP IP. Um, and then you have the centralized management. And of course, because it's all in one location, you get to do centralized backup and so on. It just simplifies the environment significantly. The, the, the biggest thing I found with um, doing GPFS was remembering that the commands were very similar to other AIX and other commands, but they all started MM. And so you have like to mount a file system, it's not mount, it's MM mount. And, and that's one of the things you just have to keep in mind. Other than that, managing it, you know, you've still got databases, file servers, backup and archive and so on. Um, you still have to manage that data and back it up. And so on. In terms of actually what the cluster would look like, you basically have a number of nodes. Each node, whether it's a client or a server, no matter what platform, it's going to have GPFS installed. Then you have some kind of access to the storage area network. It could be a dedicated SAN, where you've actually got dedicated fiber carts. You could be using um, a VIO servers with vSCSI and MPIV. And in the environment we were running, we actually have a combination of vSCSI and MPIV to the same disks. So two of our nodes are using vSCSI, one's using MPIV. But it's all the same disks at the end. And then you have the simultaneous LUN access here. It basically, when you buy GPFS, there's no add-ons. You buy a GPFS license, and if it's a server license, you get all the snapshots, replication, et cetera, with that license. You get everything up front. And then it's a separate client license, which is obviously um, at a you know, reduced price. GPFS itself uses a network-based block IO. And what that means is here, I have application data that I want to access. And if I have a network-attached node, so it's, it doesn't actually have fiber adapters, it's not connected to those LUNs, it basically does a network connection to one of the nodes that has a fiber connection to get the data. And it's, it sends it as a block-level IO request over TCP IP. Um, it's very, very easy to implement that, and that's actually one of the things that um, there's an article I have published, and I also have some documentation in this presentation on how to add a network-based client so that you can see how simple it is to do. And people typically do a combination. They'll have some direct SAN attached clients, but a lot of the times they'll also have the, one of the ones that they don't have to perform as well. They will do uh, network-attached clients. So in terms of operating systems and software, uh, right now in the fact they list that you obviously AIX, um, the versions that are supported vary depending on the version of GPFS that you're running. Both Linux on Power and Linux on x86 are supported. And so you have RAL and SLES, and I've got the specific versions on the next slide. And then they also support Linux running under VMware and then Windows 2008 Server. And then there's a bunch of software that takes advantage of GPFS, and I've listed some of them here, uh, DB2 Oracle, SAP SAS, and so on. All of these will function quite nicely with uh, GPFS. So these are the supportive environments. And as you can see right now, uh, for GPS 3.5, it is not supported on AIX 5.3, but uh, AIX 6 and 7 it is. And I'm recommending everybody go to AIX 7 anyway at this point, because AIX 7, doesn't even doesn't go out of maintenance um, till I think it's like 2022 or something. So if you're at AIX 7, you're not going to have to do a version change for a very very long time. And here you can see with Linux on power, um, you've got RHEL 5 and 6, and obviously when they bring out RHEL 7, that'll be supported. The same with SUSE. 
um, 12 is coming out soon, so that should be supported. And then you've got your two Windows Server, um, x64 and Service Pack 2 and R2. Uh, the FAQ that I sent the link to, provided the link earlier, that FAQ actually has a whole bunch of other OS levels, kernel levels, patches, and so on. So right now I'm at GPFS 3.5, I think it's 6 pack 15. And that was the latest as of about four weeks ago. In terms of licensing, there are two kinds of license. There's a GPFS server license and a GPFS client license. If you buy the GPFS server license, that's what you need on the server nodes um, that are going to take roles like being a core manager, a file system manager, an NSD server, and so on. And that's what you need if you're going to export data out through NFS or FTP and so on. At a minimum, you have to have one GPFS server license node or ALPA. Um, to get any kind of high availability, you have to have at least two and if you do two, you do something called a tiebreaker disk. In our case, we didn't want to do a tiebreaker disk, so we did three. So we have three GPFS server licenses, and then everybody else we made a client. And even if you have a client license, you can still access data locally or via the network. Um, in terms of Linux and Windows, it's a PVU-based licensing. Uh, in terms of power systems, it's per core licensing. So you could have a 16-core server with you know, 32 GPFS LPARs, but you're going to pay for 16 cores on power. And then there's specific offerings that are for when you start to get very complicated and you want to have thousands of nodes. Um, that's when we have to start talking to the GPFS team about like bulk licensing. But it's good to understand the licensing. All right, so in terms of the actual architecture, it's based on, as I said earlier, a shared disk and stand model. So we have the cluster, which is the collection of all the, um, they call them fabric interconnected nodes, but they could be IP or SAN. Obviously, you've got some kind of a switching fabric, which is how things get moved around. And then it's all parallelized. And the next slide actually has a little diagram that um, sort of gives you a better idea. So here's the clients, servers, and this is really your whole switching fabric. Now, what GPFS is not, is a client server file system like NFS, DFS, or AFS, so that's a distributed file system or Andrews file system. There isn't a single server bottleneck, and there's no protocol overhead for the transfer. If you think about how NFS works, it's very slow because it's very chatty. Um, GPFS is not like that. And if you have it set up correctly, the uh, metadata service is handled by all three of, in my case, of the GPFS nodes, so I don't get I don't get hung up waiting on one particular node to reply to everything. Um, so get, there are much fewer bottlenecks than you'll see with something like NFS. Now what GPFS does do is if you define a file system across three or four NSDs, it is going to do block level striping. So it will stripe across the LUNs within that pool. It, depending on your file system policies, it uses different methods for doing the striping. I went with the defaults. And it is independent of RAID, so we, we attach SAN disk, and in the SAN it's probably RAID 1 or RAID 5, depending, or RAID 6, depending on what you have behind the scenes. It then takes, when, when you create the GPFS file system, it then stripes that file system across the NSDs that you tell it to use. And then there's a whole lot of things around block sizes. I have some recommendations that I pulled out of some of the IBM documents on um, some of the best practices for uh, block sizes and so on. In terms of locking, GPFS, as I said, allows parallel access. It takes care of all of the locking for you, and it does that using a token system. It uses the distributed management techniques where it basically takes, has management nodes that take care of that, all the locking and managing all of the file systems and data that's out there. And then on each node, you'll see a GPFS daemon, and that GPFS daemon takes care of actually managing the data and, and access to the data. A couple of things on tuning, there's a lot of information in the FAQ on tuning. But number one, before you go into a GPFS environment, you have to synchronize all of the clocks on all of the nodes. So whether you use NTP or some other methodology, you need to make sure that everybody in the node, that when you look at the time on them, it's all synchronized. 
You don't want things that are two or three minutes off. That's going to play havoc with all your locking and everything else. In terms of the cache, um, there's, there's three critical things that you have to work with. One is the page pool, max files to cache, and max stack cache. And I have a lot of information on these, and actually at the very end, uh, when we finish, there's two slides that actually have a lot of detail about what each of these really is. So the page pool is where you cache all your data and your file system metadata. And if that's not big enough, it's going to limit the number of asynchronous reads and writes you can do. And the last thing you want is to have reads fall back to doing, async to doing synchronous I.O. So typically that is a value that we bump up. The max files to cache has a default of 4,000 on GPFS 3.5. And that basically says this is the total number of different files that can be cached at the same time. That translates into memory that is required. So if you take that value and you multiply it by 3 kilobytes, that's how much physical memory is going to be required in the LPAR to support max files to cache. And then max stat cache is some additional caching for stat calls and so on. And each one of those that you pick is like 400 bytes. So if you want to know how much memory you need just for caching, on GPFS, you take the sum of this page pool, your max files to cache times 3KB and your max stack cache times 400, and figure out, and you sum that up, and that's how much memory you need. Now, the other thing to note is that for these two caches here, they have to be less than or equal to 50% of the memory for the node. So when you sum this up, that's not the total memory you need for the LPAR. You need to add some additional memory in order to support these. Otherwise, it will cut back the size of your caches, no matter what you put. I have a bit more information on the page pool here. But it can be anywhere between 128 meg to 16 gig. Um, and for Linux in particular, it cannot exceed more than 50% of your physical memory. And that's you know, and then you have to add on the max files to cache and the max stack cache size. It is also pinned memory, which means it is not available for anything else. So that's why I said you have to add in some additional memory for the operating system. There are optimum sizes that you should pick, and typically you, you look at making sure you have enough for two application operations for every LUN. So you take the number of LUNs and multiply it by the block size, multiply it by two, and then by the maximum number of tasks per node. Or you could do what other people do and simply estimate what you think it should be um, and then monitor it. And there's an MMPMON command that you can use to actually monitor what's going on. You know, there's some comments here about when large page pools are helpful. If you have a lot of reuse or a lot of random access. Also, a lot of people get confused because they think that the, um, it's, I've got VM tune here, but it's really now IOO and VMO. Um, those are the AIX tuning parameters. They don't affect the page pool size or anything about the page pool because GPFS takes care of its own caching. You, you still want to tune VMO, et cetera, for the rest of the system, but for GPFS itself, this page pool and the other caches are where you do your tuning for caching. Now, in terms of the cluster setup, if you do an MMLS config, it's going to show you what your defaults are set to. And then there's some things that you may end up tuning. And these aren't necessarily the recommended ones. For Oracle, there are some specific things. These are called out in the FAQ. Um, they recommend that, in general, you're going to have a GPFS file system block size of 512 kilobytes. If it's a shared system with lots of small files, you, you go with 256. And if it's a huge file system, like over a terabyte, you're probably going to look more like at one megabyte. These are things you're going to have to try and test, but these are some of the recommendations in the FAQ for Oracle. You also may end up tweaking something like max megabytes per second. And what that is is for a single node, what the expectation would be for performance. So if it's a one gigabit per second network connection, then you're talking about 100 megabytes a second. Um, so what they say is set it to 20 to 50 percent higher. And obviously, you, you have to look at what different nodes you have and, and set it for each node. Or you come up with something that you think will work pretty much across the board. Oh, just a little bit more on the Oracle. And here's the actual link to the Oracle general thoughts. You want to set your GP. There's some worker threads that you need to set. There's actually worker one and worker two threads. I have some more details in those last couple of slides. But prefetch threads, worker one threads, and NSD max worker threads are all threads that are going to help with making Oracle run better in a parallel environment. So the link up here for the Oracle 
actually has a lot of information on that, and particularly it has information if you're running in an Oracle rack environment. And typically for an Oracle point of view, where I see GPFS is in Oracle rack. So now, let's talk about building a cluster. So in our environment, we had a couple of different options for building our cluster. What we wanted to do was have redundant disks as well as nodes that would fail over. The two different ways to have failover, I mean, you can do a single server node. Um, we, I actually have one where I have a single server cluster that only has one primary node. So if it fails, the whole cluster goes down. And then I have a couple of clients. That's like a test environment. Um, in production, you wouldn't do it that way. So in production, you have two choices for failover. One is to have two server nodes. You still have shared LUNs. And then you have one disk that is shared between the two of them that's called a tiebreaker disk. And that's perfectly fine in production um, where you have one disk subsystem. In the environment that we were in, where we wanted to test, and in this case we simulated two different disk subsystems providing the LUNs, with, um, we didn't want to do a tiebreaker disk because you can only have the one of them, and we wanted to obviously have them coming from distant disk subsystems. So we decided to go with three server nodes so that we could have quorum and shared LUNs, and then we used something called failure groups. What failure groups allows you to do is split the LUNs, and we'll just say we split them in half, and we can do half of them in one failure group and half of them in the other. So I can lose up to half my LUNs out of one failure group and still be up and running because effectively failure groups kind of do mirroring. The environment that we built, we have three LPARs, um, FT1, FT2, and NL1. They happen to be on the same server, but they could have been on different servers. They are all fiber, they're all fiber connected to the same disks and obviously zoned that way. I think these two are virtual SCSI and this one's MPIV, but it's all the same disks that they're seeing, so they see the same eight disks. And then they're connected to the network. Then I actually have one client which is called BPIC-SD, and that is network connected only. So in order to get to the GPFS cluster, it uses the network to access it. So that's the environment that we're going to be running in. And in fact, you can see from them this MMLS cluster that I have four nodes running. Here, my primary is FT1, my secondary is FT2, and then here's NL1. The three that are direct connected I set up as quorum managers. And then my little client I did not set up as a quorum manager for obvious reasons. I also do have set up with SSH so that I can do things like use the MMDish DSH command to send a command to everybody in the nodes. Uh, so you can see here I just sent a date command and all four nodes responded. Let's talk a little bit about failure groups. In our case, we wanted to test disk redundancy from each of two V7000s. Now, I only have one, so what I did was I said I'll take, I'll use eight disks in my set, but I'll take four of them and pretend they're from a different V7000. We have actually done this for real with two V7000s and with and other disk subsystems. But in my lab, I only have one. So in order to demonstrate this, I pretty much pretended I had two. So I took H disk 1 through 4 and treated it as the A, and 5 through 8 treated it as B. So I assigned them to different failure groups. And I'll show you the file for doing that. What this let me do was do the equivalent to LVM mirroring, which GPFS does not support. So as I said, if I lose H disk 1 through 4, my GPFS cluster will stay up because it's mirrored over to 5 through 8. And then I've got full redundancy. And we actually did do some testing when we had the two V7000s. And we actually unzoned one of them, and the cluster stayed up. So we know that this works from redundancy. So in this environment, if we'd had two disk subsystems, we would have full redundancy through the nodes, because we have three of them, and we only need two to have quorum and full redundancy through the disk subsystem because we brought stuff across from two different disk subsystems. So failure groups is a really good option for making sure that you have a, a redundant stable environment. And you could do this bringing stuff across from different controllers on the same disk subsystem to give you control of redundancy or whatever. Let's talk about the installation process. So in my case, I, I had an AIX-only environment. I've also done an install with AIX and Windows. So first I installed all the servers with AIX. Um, I chose to put 7.1, the latest service pack, on. Um, I think one of them might be at actually AIX version 6, 
but I made sure that I was at the supported AIX version. I also made sure I zoned all of the GPFS LUNs to all three LPARs. In this case, that meant that I, actually, as I said, two of them are vSCSI, one of them is MPIV. So I made sure they were zoned all the way through and obviously ran Config Manager so I could see the disks. And then I set, did all my the regular tuning that I would do. Here you can see I changed the fiber adapters to increase the DMA size and also to increase num command alums. You're going to have to pick the values that your uh, disk vendor will support, um, specifically for num command alums. And it'll be somewhere between 1024 and 2048. The dash capital P says make it stick over a reboot and this doesn't come into being until you do a reboot. Just a little note, if you're using MPIV, you have to change it on the client LPAR as well as the VIO server. And the VIO server must be the same size or larger as what you put on MPIV um, on the client. In the case of vSCSI, you only change it on the VIO server because um, you don't see the fiber adapters of the client. Then on the LPARs, I change each H disk and I set the Q depth to whatever supported. Um, obviously set the disks to no reserve. And um, if I'm using STD PCM, then I make sure I use load balance as my algorithm. And you know, in the case of vSCSI, I'm going to set uh, I'm going to set this on the uh, VIO server. Then I actually put a PVID on each disk. And the reason I put a PVID on the disks is because you know I'm I'm talking about three nodes, and I want to make absolutely sure that I match up these disks later on properly. Having a PVID on them does help with that. If I change the VIO servers, I reboot them and then I reboot the client LPARs. So this is just getting my AIX and my disks there where I can see them. We now see them, and now we're going to start with the installer GPFS. The installer GPFS is, is really no different to any other AIX install. You install the product using uh, Smitty or install P, and then in my case I went on and I installed Fixpack 15. There's a directory that you need to add to your path and Etsy environment, and that's the, the one that I'm adding just here. Uh, so this is my user local, uh, sorry, my user LPP MMFS bin. That's where all of the GPFS commands are. And then you also have to add a working collective. So whenever you do a GPFS command, it looks at this working collective um, to see who to issue it to. So I told it the name of my working collective, and I put everything for GPFS and slash user local etc. Um, you could pick whatever directory you want. Now after you've installed it. If you do an LSLPP, you should see something like this. And I'm showing you the AIX stuff. Um, so here you can see my base is at Fixpack 15. And so obviously I put on GPFS base, um, and then I upgraded everything to that Fixpack I mentioned. If we go into ETC environment, you'll see where I actually changed. Here's my path here. And you can see here I put the user LPP MMFS bin on the end. And here's my working collective. Um, also in ETC security limits, I set the file size default to minus one, which basically says a file can be as big as it can be, and I set my number of files to 20,000. Um, you may have to have that larger for the number of files. You may not want it that large. It's basically the number of files you can have in a file system. In order to have things like MMDSH work and a number of other commands to work properly without intervention, you have to set up SSH between all of the LPARs, and this includes the clients later without passwords. You can just do the generic SSHing from each node, and you have to SSH to yourself. That way you show up in known hosts. Then you generate your keys, and then you copy them into authorized keys. When you add clients, you have to continue to do this. You also have to add your own key into authorized keys too. And SSH must permit root login. There is a more secure way to do this. Obviously, we don't like giving root logins. Um, I think I have the link later on which actually tells you how to make um, SSH more secure when you're setting it up this way. Um, and at this point you would then log out and log back in. Since GPFS is installed by root, unfortunately it is root that you have to do this with, um, something that none of us are usually particularly happy about. So right now I'm just doing my server nodes. So I create a file on each of them, um, and if we go back, you know, you'll see that my working collective, user local etc, gpfs-nodes.txt. So that's the same file here, and literally each of the server names. Now, one of the things you do have to decide up front is are you going to use short names like I am, or are you going to use fully qualified host names? And whichever way you do it, you have to be consistent throughout here. So I use short names everywhere, 
but I also had to do one where we used fully qualified names because when we did host name, that host used fully qualified names. So make sure going in that you know which one it is. And then on the primary node, I created another version of the same file, again with the same nodes in it. This nodes init.txt is just identifying that these are all Quora managers, and that's used um, in one of the commands we issue later. So this is all done, these ones here are done on the primary, this one here is done on all three nodes, because each, each of the three nodes is going to use this for its working collective. All right, now we also now have to define our disks, and this is where there's multiple ways that are published for doing this, where you end up using multiple files. Um, this is how you do it with one file. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking, remember I said I had hdisk 1 through 4, and then I was going to mirror those to 5 through 8. So here's my hdisk 1 through 4, and I'm actually renaming the disks. So I went, this is NSD, failure group 2, disk 1, which maps to hdisk 1. And then here I've got NSD, failure group 3, disk 5 mapping to hdisk 5. I actually did both data and metadata on the same ones. I could have separated those out, but I'm going for simple here. And then you can see I've got the failure group here. So I tried to make the NSD name match a combination of the failure group and the HDISC name. Um, that makes things a lot simpler for me. And I'm definitely into simple when it comes to this kind of thing. Then what that ends up looking like after you create it is ignore the file system, but basically here's my disk names and my NSD servers. So you can see those, and I can also do, I think it's an MMLSPV. This shows me each disk and how it's mapped to an NSD. That's what I just, by build, when I built that file, that's what I, how I was telling it to map it. And now what we're going to do is we are going to, you know, right now we've just created the file. We only create this on the primary then what we have to do is start to step through the actual install process. So the first thing we have to do is create a cluster. Here we have the create cluster command. We're giving the cluster a name. And that basically we're saying, here's the cluster name. The primary is FT1. The secondary is FT2. Uh, we're going to use SSH and SCP, and here's how you find them for a lot of our commands. And our nodes, you're going to find in that gpfs nodes in it.txt. So this is, so if you remember, we had this file here that was basically identifying the core of managers. And that's the file we're referring back to here. You then have to accept the licenses. So these three serve, uh, FT1, FT2, and NL1 are all servers. So I basically say, accept the server license for these three nodes. So at this point, we've, we've built a cluster, but the cluster has nothing in it, apart from there are three nodes that exist in it. So if you were to do an LS cluster, and you know, here's the one that I've got right now, in it's showing me the cluster name, those remote shell and copy commands, the primary and the secondary, and right now I have a client in there. You're not going to see that because we haven't added it yet. So this is what it would have looked like just after I built it. We also do an LS config, and it shows me those default parameters. So I didn't change any of them from the default, so I have um, you know, the default set for my page pool and so on and so on. And, there's no, and there are no uh, file systems that exist. It's also good to do an mmgetState-AV. That actually gives you the status of each of the nodes in the cluster. So here you can see that all three of my server nodes are actually active. And now we're going to create the NSDs. So this is where we go back to that file where I put that stanza together that mapped the hdisk to an NSD, and I actually gave the NSDs a name. I ran this create. I said, go to that NSD stanza.txt and create me my NSDs. So here, if I do an LSPV, it actually shows me each of the hdisks. It shows me the PVID and what, what it's mapped to. The interesting thing is that even if the hdisks came onto the other server, in a different order, so that you know, HDisk one on one server is HDisk three on the other server. What you'll see when you do an LSPV on those is that these are correctly mapped, and you just compare this PVID and HDisk to whatever it got mapped to over on the other servers, and the mappings come across correctly. 
So then we do an LSNSD, and by default, right, we don't have any file systems yet, so these NSDs are going to show as directly attached. That's because they're fiber attached, and we have not added network connectivity. So right now, anybody that wanted to talk to those NSDs would have to be SAN attached. So that's going to be one of the first things we change. And what we're doing here is we do a change NSD command, and we go for each disk, I want you to connect it to FT1, FT2, NL1. That says that basically it will allow us to do network as well as local connections. Now by default, what will happen is when somebody tries to access a, a disk, it will try local blocks, so for SAN, etc. If that fails, it will then try using a network connection, which is the NSD piece. And every node, when it brings up the GPFS daemons, will actually try to discover the disks and figure out if it's local or network. You can actually tell a client, and I've got an example later on, that it is only to use network, only to use SAN, or it can use either. So with the change that we just did here, each of these nodes will do local first, and then it will try network. Um, but since they are actually the server nodes, we needed to have them do that so that the client nodes would be able to do network connectivity through them. Now if we do our MMLSD, you notice that this has changed from direct attached, and it actually lists the servers. And then we have our disks. So again, we still don't have any file systems, but we can actually connect to those disks um, via SAN or via network. It creates a bunch of um, configuration files, so I actually went and I, I looked at those. So here you can see there's, um, they go into var mmfs gen. There is a var mmfs etsy, and there's nothing useful in it. The config files go in gen for some reason. You don't ever edit these. You need to use mmch config to change them. But in the mmfs.config file, that's where you're going to see your cluster name. I'm node configuration one because I'm the primary. There's like numeric numbers and so on. There's also a node data file. And in that, it's basically saying I'm node number one. I'm the manager um, and information about my node. Uh, there's also an NSD map file, which actually shows you how things are mapped. And then there's a an NSD physical volume one. So that's where if you do the MMLSPV, that's where you'll actually see, in fact, I'll, I'll do that now. Um, if I do the MMLSPV, you can actually see that it got that information out of here, because you know the, the names all match. So now we have a cluster. That cluster has NSDs. It doesn't have any file systems yet, but we're going to add a client, just because we can. So in this case, we install GPFS and we set up SSH and everything on the client node. We then, from the primary, go add BPICSD as a client node. So we're actually saying it's a client. And then we actually agree, agree to the license for that node, but we're agreeing to a client license, not a server license. Now if you do your MMLS cluster, you're going to see what I was showing you before, where we have all the other stuff doesn't change, but now suddenly my little BPICSD shows up as a uh, client LPAR. And you know, it's not a core manager or anything like that, so it's not an administrative node. So we'll start it up, and now if we do our MM state, get state at dash AV, you'll actually see that it shows up as, a, as being active. And again, you know, this is what it looks like here. MM get state dash AV, here's my node na numbers, my names, and the GPFS state. So everybody's active, that's what we want to see. Uh, you can also do a MM get state dash ALF, and that actually gets you a little bit more information about the cluster. It's showing me that I have, it's showing me the same four things it did up above, but it's actually giving me information about how many nodes I need for quorum, which is two how many nodes I have up, three, and that's for the quorum nodes, um, which is these three here, um, and then total nodes connected, which is four. And again, it gives you summary down here, and then it just tells me I achieve quorum. You know, it's useful It's useful stuff to have. And these are probably the MMLS config, um, MMLS cluster, and the MMGetState-AV and-ALS are probably the four most useful commands that you're going to learn.
We're going to add a file system. I'm keeping it simple. I'm using the default block size and everything else. But I'm using replication. Because remember, I have family group 2 and family group 3. So what I'm doing is I'm going to create my GPFS file system across the four disks in family group 2. And I'm going to replicate them across the four disks in family group 3. You know, we want to make sure that that's what we're actually doing. Just to remind you, we set up our NSD stanza, and our NSD stanza says HDisk 1 through 4 are failure group 2, and HDisk 5 through 8 are failure group 3. And what we're doing here is we're saying create the file system slash GPFS 0. GPFS will know it as GPFS 0. This file system can be called anything you want. I just kept it simple. Get all the information on the NSDs to use from this NSD file. We're going to have two replicas. We're going to have a maximum of two replicas for the, that's for the metadata. And then we're going to have two replicas for the data and a maximum of two replicas for the data. All right, so it creates the file system, and then we mount it. So now if we do a df-g on slash gpfs0, you'll see that I've got 320 gig file system, and it's 1% used, um, and it's called slash gpfs0. Interestingly enough, it looks different uh, from a um, GPFS point of view. If I was to do a DF on that, um, and I think it's a little bit different on the way I set it up on my system, but you can see here I do my DF-G GPFS0, and here's my 320 gig, etc. If I do an MMDF, it gives me a lot more information. So here it's saying for this file system, it's spread across these NSDs, and it shows me my failure groups. It's showing me that they're holding metadata and data. It's showing me how much free space I have, how many free kilobytes, etc. It's showing me how many inodes, etc. are used. So it gives you an awful lot of information. And that's really what this is showing you here. Now, right now, we can mount this file system on our primary three nodes, but we haven't set our client node up to mount it as a network mount. So we need to go and do that. So that's what we're doing here. There are four options that we can use for use NSD servers. The default is as needed, which is try the local first, then try the network and switch back later. In the case of BPKSD, it doesn't have any fiber cards, so we want it to always be network. The commands we're going to need are these. We're going to unmount the GPFS0 file system, and then we're going to mount it, and we're going to say always use NSD servers. So that basically says to it, I want you to always do a network mount of this file system. So if I was to look at it, over there, it's going to look the same as everywhere else, but the difference is going to be that it's um, connecting over the network. It's not connecting by fiber. But here's what's interesting. Remember, we have a failure group. If I add a 4 gig file, which is what this DD is doing, so I'm adding a 4 gig file into the GPFS cluster, into my GPFS zero file system. You have to be very careful when you start using the, the DU and DF commands because, because it's replicated and it's one file system, it takes my 4 gig file and if you look here, I do my DF, and it looks like I'm using 8 gig. If I, D a D, if I do a DU on the file system, it looks like I'm using 8 gig. But if I do an LS-AL, it's clear I'm only using 4 gig. The problem is, because we're doing two replicas, it sums the total. And so when it's showing the total space used, it's showing you the total across the two replicas. Uh, that was something I found to be very, very frustrating. It's just something to keep in mind because it's something that may confuse you. Really, the LSFS is showing you what you're really using. So if you know you're using two replicas, when you do the DF-G or the DU-G, you know that it's actually really half of that. I, I don't understand why there's not an option to um, determine the correct number. And then you can do an MMLS mount all, and it will actually tell you that it's mounted on all the nodes. All right, so what are the other kind of things that you want to do? You have a file system, you're running out of space, so you want to add more disks. All right, so since we're using failure groups, you want to add a disk to each failure group. So we, we add the two disks, we set up our QDEPs and everything, um, our new disks come in as HDIS 10 and 11. Since we're changing QDEPs and all those other commands, we obviously need a reboot to put them in place. Then we just set up another file with the two new disks we want to add. And here we define them as HDIS 10 and 11, sorry, 
and we give them names, one's in failure group two, one's in failure group three. These names can be anything you want. I just like to, I like names that make it really clear what I'm doing. That's how I name them, and obviously I make sure that my failure groups and pool names match. So on my primary, I create the NSDs, and I'm basically saying, I want you to create these NSDs um, from this file and add them to these nodes. So that's what I'm doing here. Then I'm adding the disks to the GPFS file system. So here I go, OK, now that I have my NSDs, I'm going to add these disks. So we do the mm add disk GPFS 0, and we point it to that same file, and we do the dash r. What the dash r does, and you don't have to do this, but the dash r basically tells it to rebalance all of the files across in the file system across the disks. So let's say you're adding four or five more disks on each side, you definitely want to make sure that you actually rebalance them. Otherwise, they don't, it doesn't restripe them. You can use a dash A flag, and you can also you can actually tell it that you want a specific node. So let's say the node that you're on is really, really busy, so you don't want it to be doing it. So you basically say, you know what? There's not a lot going on on NL1, so why don't you just have NL1 do the restriping, and these other two nodes can carry on doing other stuff. And at that point, you can use DF and MMDF to check that everything is well. Just remember, with DF, it'll show you all the file systems. With MMDF, you have to specify the file system, and you have to use the GPFS name for it. If you're like me and you make mistakes, at some point you may have to remove the cluster or remove NSDs from the cluster. Um, so this is the process I had to go through, because at one point I had to destroy and rebuild the cluster. And it was like unmounting everything, deleting the file system, deleting all the NSDs. Um, if you just want to like change how you're using the disks or whatever, you don't have to delete all of them. You just you know get rid of the file system. Obviously, you shut it down, and then you can delete the node. Now, if you're just getting rid of one node, then obviously on that node, you will simply unmount any file systems it has mounted, and you'll do the delete node. So you'd do an MMDEL node dash capital N. You wouldn't do the dash A. The dash A does everybody. Once you've deleted a node or deleted the cluster, you want to check this directory and make sure there's nothing in it. You know, if you look at it normally, it has a whole bunch of files in it. And you can see them here. Once you basically get rid of a node, most of these files should disappear. And it should look more like this. I have here a list of some of the useful commands. These are commands that you're going to use all the time. Uh, that should be a lowercase here, um, that M PowerPoint was trying to help me. The ls cluster, ls config, get state, and so on are commands that you'll use all the time. The mmls manager is simply going to list for you who the manager node is for the, the file system right now. So in this case, my file system manager is ft1, and my cluster manager node right now is ft2. Those will change depending on you know who gets rebooted when and so on. All of the ones that are like MMLS, MMGET, um, MM dish issues multiple commands, MMDF, most of these are, are very safe commands to use. Anything that starts with DAL, RM, or CH, you really need to look at the man pages and make sure you understand the command before you use it. So this is the MMLS disk command, and this is what you can use to see what disks are actually in a file system. You just basically run the MMLS disk, and again, you know, just to show you that here they are here telling me the disk name, what kind of driver type it is, the sector size, all the information about that disk that it has. And, you know, you can see here the storage pool. You can have different storage pools. Um, ours is a fairly simple environment, so I didn't get complicated. I didn't go around messing with storage pools or anything like that, but that is definitely something you have an option to do. You can also do an MMLSFS on a file system to see all the different values that you can set and then it tells you what the current value is in a description of it. So you know, here it's like, I'm not enforcing quotas. I went with a 256k block size. And, and there's a number of other values that you can actually set, including things like default mount point. Here it lists actually all the NSDs that it's actually connected on, and so on. OK, I mentioned monitoring. And um, this, was, this was actually a command that I wasn't aware of. So it was actually quite useful to find out. But there's an, uh, there's an MMPMON command that actually will give you some information. So I'm just going to type it in over the other side and um, have it run. Basically, you create this pmon in.txt file, 
And I've just got to create that while we're talking about this. And it has like, in this case, I just put four lines in it. I want version. I want some I/O information. I want some file system I/O information. And I want I want the some, the history off, so it just gives me everything that's new. Then you run the mmpmon command, and you tell it that my input file is the one I just created, and I'm just going to run it a two-second snap, two two second two snaps, and they're going to be 2,000 microseconds apart. And you can add a dash p flag to get it in single line format. I didn't bother. So what you actually see here is here's where I'm running the command. It's running it on FT1. It gives me a timestamp. And then it gives me a whole bunch of information about the cluster, how many disks, how many bytes were read and written during that time, opens and closes, um, and so on. And then it gives me, you know, for the next um, 2,000 microseconds. You know, that's a very simple usage of it, but you can actually use that command to get information about how that GPFS cluster is uh, performing. Some directories that you need to be aware of. Uh, bar MMFS gen, we talked about. That's where your config files are. And that's used by GPFS. You don't go in there editing things, not if you want your GPFS cluster to stay up. You also have user LPP MMFS bin. That's where all your GPFS commands are, and that's the directory that you're going to add. Then we have user local Etsy. This is where I put my GPFS input files for creation. You may want to use use a local GPFS or something, but have it be a consistent place. And then there's a number of different logs. Um, if you need to actually get into the logs for GPFS, uh, the, in var ADM RAS, there's an mmfs.log.latest and .previous. And of course, there's the regular AIX or Linux uh, syslogs. So this is actually the output I, I took from an mmpmon. I just put them side by side so you could compare iteration one and two. There was nothing going on in the cluster, so I'm not surprised that the bytes written, et cetera, didn't change. But this is something that you can look at for your own cluster. And there's a bunch of different flags on MMPMON, so you may want to look at what you can do and then look at what you would really put in that PMON in.txt. Yeah, so it's useful to you. I also um, threw together a very basic script, and since then, um, one of the people that I work with is a, um, has actually added a whole bunch of stuff to it. But this is just a script that will actually document the cluster. So, you know, I have a, a root directory is slash user local perf, so everything will go in there. There's a whole bunch of, like, setting dates and names and stuff. And then, you know, I save my mmls config, cluster, get state, ls manager. Um, I've got a bunch of other ls commands I'm going to add to the script, but this gives you an idea of, like, how you might document your cluster so that you actually have a record of, of what's going on. I put a bunch of links in here to all of the GPFS documentation pages. Um, there's a, a stuff on developer works about backups. This particular home page links to all of the GPFS books. And then this one links to all of the commands. I had mentioned that there was a very good article on strengthening your SSH configuration for GPFS. Uh, this developer works article actually goes into how you would really set up GPFS um, so that you can limit, you know, when you turn on root login, that you can actually limit it in your SSH configuration to only, you know, FT1 being able to SSH to FT2, that the rest of the world can't do a root login. So this is a very, very useful uh, link, and I would suggest that you'll read it because you'll actually find that this is going to help when you have to deal with your security people when you tell them that you're going to let root SSH without a password. That doesn't usually fly very well with security. At least this way you can say, well, I have to do it for GPFS, but this is how I'm going to limit it. This one here is also, I've mentioned before, that you can build a two-node GPFS cluster using tiebreaker disks. This is a document that IBM has out there on how to do that. So if you, you know, aren't um, interested in doing it the way we did it, where we wanted to have the redundancy across um, different disk subsystems, then you can, you can do a two-node one with a a tiebreaker disk, and this actually has very, very clear instructions on how to do that. And then there's just the general GPFS resources. There's a whole bunch of other links that I put in here on storage pools, tuning, integrating it with TSM and so on, and a very good read book. So hopefully you'll find all of those helpful. A list of um, some journal articles. We ju I just had one at IBM Systems Magazine actually published on implementing a GPFS 3-node cluster. So
I have the link to that at the very beginning, I believe, of this presentation. Uh, in fact, I have it at the end as well. So you'll, you'll have all this with the presentation as long as you go to this link, download it. Um, and, and this is the article. And then I had mentioned that at the end, I have some descriptions on these parameters. So these are in here for really for you to, to look at and get descriptions from them. But I have all of the tunable parameters listed here and here with very verbose descriptions of what they actually do. Again, I want to thank you for attending.